If you have irregular cycles, have struggled with obesity, or have gut dysfunction, you are likely at risk for osteoporosis. Doesn't even matter if you are in your 20s, 30s, 40s, or beyond, but if you have any of those things, please pay attention because this is a story about a patient of mine who is 32 years old with severe osteoporosis that was luckily caught early and we have plenty of time to resolve it, but she had a lot of things that I wanna to talk to you about. So stick around, we're gonna talk about some risk factors that women and men need to pay attention to early on in their adult life so that they can prevent osteoporosis and falls as they age. Stick around. Okay, so let me tell you about my patient, Carolyn. So she is a 32-year-old woman. She had some risk factors for osteoporosis, and fortunately, she was diagnosed early. Now, this is not common because most 32-year-old women, no matter what their risk factors, are not screened for osteoporosis. I think she actually had a fracture, and this led her down the pathway of being diagnosed with osteoporosis. Then she found her way to us, and she did that by finding our YouTube channel. So if you haven't yet, go ahead and click that subscribe button so that more people on their search will find this information that we're putting out for them. So anyway, Carolyn had an interesting uh, history of risk factors. And I want to run through the top three risk factors that I see, particularly in women this age, because if you wait until you get until your 50s and 60s to be diagnosed and you have severe osteoporosis in your 30s, chances are you're not going to make it that long without breaking your spine or your hip. So it's really important that we as young women and men understand these risk factors so that we can get screened and diagnosed early. And if you know anybody that fits this group, please get them screened early early. A DEXA is cheap. It is easy. Uh, it does not hurt. And I would strongly recommend anybody to go down that path if they fit this group. All right. So the first group that I'm going to talk about are those with metabolic dysfunction. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is metabolic dysfunction for me is the early signs of what would eventually be diabetes. So we're talking about insulin resistance. A lot of times this is weight gain. This is being overweight. This is being obese eventually becoming pre-diabetic and diabetic. They are not always the same thing, but they are often the same thing. And what I see in this group is that although you might think that extra weight is protective of bones, it's really not. And what we see is that people that are overweight and obese are often chronically dieting. They are chronically calorie depleted. They are generally, unfortunately, eating nutrient uh, poor, but calorie dense foods, and they go back and forth and back and forth. And unfortunately, when you're in a catabolic state, which is what weight loss requires, when you're in a catabolic state, your bones will break down too. And add on top of that, a lot of the other dysfunctions that occur with being overweight and obese, thyroid dysfunction, sex hormone dysfunction, uh, adrenal dysfunction, all of these, those things will also impact bone health. And so people that are overweight, struggling with metabolic dysfunction, and especially if they have already developed diabetes, are at risk for osteoporosis. And almost nobody would ever think that that would be the case. But these people do need to be screened with a DEXA to make sure that their bones are in good shape. Another interesting thing to consider here, my wife talks about this all the time with her weight loss program at PhD Weight Loss. Um, visceral fat is a big part of weight, is a big part of weight loss, and you should head over to her YouTube channel uh, if you haven't heard her talk about that. Uh, but one of the things that she teaches her clients and anybody that will talk to her about it is that visceral fat is the, the belly fat. It's the fat that's deep down inside that's wrapped around your organs. That fat is inflammatory by design. That fat will secrete inflammatory cytokines that will increase your labs. We see it in our program when we measure people's labs for inflammation. And if they have visceral fat, they have increased inflammation. So all of that to say that if someone is overweight and they have metabolic dysfunction and they're dieting, they are at risk for osteoporosis and they really should get a DEXA scan. All right, so number two. Now, uh, this is one that was really important for Carolyn uh, because she had some pretty significant gut dysfunction. Now, when I say gut dysfunction, a lot of times people don't know what I mean, and it just kind of sounds funny for those that are not in the gut space. So let me explain gut dysfunction. The most common gut dysfunction that is associated with osteoporosis is celiac disease. Now, celiac disease is actually not very common. Um, however, I feel like celiac disease and gluten sensitivity is a spectrum. So celiac disease by itself 
is uh, a very specific condition that is diagnosed a very specific way. Gluten, though, is the thing that people with celiac disease can't tolerate. Gluten, though, is not tolerated by a lot of people. So when you look at the studies on celiac disease and um, osteoporosis, what you find is that no matter how severe the disease was, in other words, if they barely had signs of it or if they had really bad celiac disease, the bone loss was the same. So that's concerning for me, and we see this often, is that people that have gluten sensitivity or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, as it's called, uh, people that have gluten sensitivity but don't have celiac disease can still have issues with their bone health because their gut still doesn't absorb very well. They can't absorb nutrients. This is why anybody that's eating gluten, I feel like is at risk potentially for, for gluten sensitivity and they may not know it. Now, how do you figure that out? Well, you can test that. Um, if you've listened to me talk about nutrition, you know that I'm not a fan of grains in general, and I don't think that really probably anybody should eat gluten. Um, that might be a little bit restrictive for a lot of people, but I ultimately find that pretty much everybody does better if they don't eat gluten. The challenge is, okay, well, what about other types of gut dysfunction? Will that have an impact? Well, of course, right? If you have overgrowth of your gut bacteria like SIBO, that's gonna impact how you absorb food. Even if you have something as simple and as normal, which is not normal, but as normal as constipation, that's gonna impact how you absorb food, right? If you have the opposite, that's gonna impact how you absorb food. Uh, if you have low stomach acid, if you can't break down protein, if you have enzyme, like all of those things will result in bone loss, muscle loss, really just not optimal health. And that's why we spend so much time talking about gut symptoms and testing gut symptoms. And that's why most of my coaches are RDs with high level degrees and additional training uh, in functional medicine and gut function because we really hammer the gut in our program. Now you can do this outside of our program too. You just gotta find the right people. But gut dysfunction is a really big one and this was a big factor for, uh, for Carolyn. Okay, so the last one. All right, so this is the big one and I hope you made it to this point. So the big one is if you have menstrual irregularity, meaning like if you are missing periods, assuming you're premenopausal, if you are on birth control, it doesn't matter if it takes away your period or not, just being on an oral or an implantable or an injectable uh, birth control, or if you've lost your period because you are an athlete, all of those things will have a significant impact on your bone. And I really wanna dig into that. So let's talk about the athletes first. My wife's PhD was actually in this topic. So it, it, a lot of people know this as the female athlete triad. Um, it is also now known as relative energy deficiency in sports or REDS. But basically it's the cessation of menstruation due to malnutrition, due to extra stress, due to basically whatever that activity is. Um, we know that being an athlete is both stressful for men and women, but the two different sexes respond differently. So women, if they get to this point, will lose their menstrual cycle. Uh, and it's just the body's attempt to hang on to energy. Um, if that happens, and this is really common, if that happens, it will put you at risk for osteoporosis. And I'm going to, I'm going to show that in a minute. I want to switch though, and talk a little bit about birth control because it kind of falls into the same thing. So oral birth control is something that when I was being trained as a physician, we just learned, Hey, this is the way that you, uh, reduce pregnancies and there's no downsides and there's no side effects and it's all good. Well, if you think about what you're doing with oral birth control, now there's various forms, but they pretty much all come in the form of a synthetic progesterone. So uh, synthetic progesterone, more powerful than natural progesterone, that's why it can cause changes to the cycle, although you can do it with progesterone. Uh, but it will potentially stop a cycle altogether. Some women just stop having cycles altogether. Um, some women, it just controls their cycle, but it changes ovulation. Pretty much it doesn't matter how it works. They are all, in my opinion, garbage. So any patient that comes to me, and I have a fair number of uh, younger women that are on birth control, and the first thing that I do, probably not the first, but one of the early things that we do is to recommend that they get off of birth control. And I don't think there's a single patient that's continued to work with us that is still on birth control because it has so many potential symptoms, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but the biggest thing here is it's the artificial progesterones. It's the progestins. The progestins are devious little compounds that will bind to both progesterone receptors and estrogen receptors. And that's why it will impact not just your progesterone levels, uh, and the progesterone receptors, but also estrogen things. So that's why when we look at the risks, and I'm just gonna go down this list, the risks are big, 
and there's a lot of them, and many of them are associated with estrogen, even though the thing doesn't have estrogen in it. And sometimes it does, but that, that's not why it has a problem. So the risks here are, number one, blood clots is a much higher risk uh, for people that are taking oral birth control than any other form. Strokes, heart attacks, uh, increases in blood pressure or hypertension, liver tumors, gallbladder disease, nausea, breast tenderness, mood changes. Again, a lot of those things that come along with estrogen dominance because those progestins are stimulating those estrogen receptors in an unnatural way. Now, here are some controversial ones. So increased risk of breast cancer. I don't know why that's listed as controversial because when you look at hormone replacement for older women, if you use progestins, just go look at the Women's Health Initiative, it shows very clearly that progestins will increase the risk of invasive breast cancer. So not controversial in my opinion. Cervical cancer, um, loss of bone density. Oh, actually, actually listed, huh? Loss of bone density, um, weight gain. Let's go back to my first one. Um, and migraines, migraine headaches. So if you're on oral birth control, um, I'm not telling anybody what to do, but again, this is something that I would strongly recommend reconsidering, talking to your team about, figuring out other ways, other methods of contraception, if that's why someone's on it. And then if they're on it for uh, for menstrual irregularities, um, uh, symptoms around bleeding, then uh, there are other ways, okay? Now, I just wanna pull up this chart uh, just to kind of drive this home because this is something that I, I think even not a lot of women understand. So this is the kind of typical hormone chart that you'll see in your OBGYN's office that talks about hormones. So you, there's four lines on this chart and you can see that the blue line is estrogen and the yellowish line is progesterone. So those are the two main hormones that we're talking about. You can ignore the other two. So what you'll notice here is that the blue line rises sort of during the follicular phase, it rises up towards ovulation, and then it drops off. It comes back up a little bit in the luteal phase, but not a lot. The progesterone rise, though, follows it, right? So progesterone stays pretty flat, and then it rises up, and it goes high, and then it drops back off. So if you've heard me talk about these hormones, you know that estrogen, when elevated, will slow down osteoclast function. Estrogen will slow down the breakdown of bone. Progesterone, though, will help build up bone. So you need the cyclic back and forth of the drop of estrogen, the rise of estrogen, the drop of estrogen, the rise of progesterone, right? So now we're cycling bone loss, bone breakdown, slowing down bone breakdown, increasing bone buildup, right? So every month, a woman's hormones are having an impact on her bone. This back and forth, this ebb and flow, we are metabolizing bone naturally every month. And if you stop this cycle, you're at risk for osteoporosis. Hands down, no question. So um, what I want to impart here is that osteoporosis is not just a disease of the elderly. We see this all the time in Carolyn at 32, women in their 30s, their 40s, their 50s. Um, it is so important if you have this to diagnose it early, because if you don't, then you are playing a very difficult game of catch up later. Uh, it's much easier to do earlier. And this is true both women and men. If you have any of these things, if you know of anybody that has any of these things, have them get a DEXA. Again, cheap, easy, extremely low risk. Really encourage you to do that. With Carolyn, we were very fortunate. We were able to catch her early and she was so grateful. So what did we do? We knew that she had some gut dysfunction, so we really uh, went deep into that, and we found that she did have, probably had a history of celiac disease. She had already given up gluten. So we're going down that pathway, and now we're improving her gut function. She's absorbing nutrients. Um, she did have a history of an eating disorder that's pretty much been resolved, so nothing to, to do there. She is a runner, uh, and so I never tell runners not to run. However, we are substituting some of her running for some resistance training. She's really loading her bones uh, and with all of the nutrients that she's getting through her new diet, but also through some hormone replacement, which we can optimize um, in premenopausal women, she is going to have the building blocks, the chemical motivation inside. And once she loads her bones, she's going to build bone like crazy. So super excited for her. Um, if you know anybody that's in this same boat, please have them watch this video, consider the masterclass. Uh, all of those things are going to be helpful. Um, if they haven't yet, or if you haven't yet, you can download uh, the free copy of our book. It's a, an ebook that you can download the PDF of, uh, or you can go to Amazon and buy the book. It is uh, inexpensive. It's an easy read. There's a link uh, to that page uh, in the description below as well. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, I think this is a really important point to get across to our younger women and men. 
Uh, and again, if you know anybody in that group, please reach out, have them watch this video, share this with them, etc. Thanks again for making it to the end of the video. I'll see you next time.